Thanks to BNH for having us and uh, to Chimani for sponsoring us. Um, so just a little, uh, just quickly, a little bit about us. So I'm Chris Nicholson. I'm the photograph, um, the author of Photographing National Parks, uh, and I also am a, a partner and instructor with National Parks at Night. We do night photography workshops in the national parks and all sorts of uh, education about night photography. Um, and uh, we're actually getting ready to announce our 2018 uh, workshop schedule in a couple of weeks. So uh, kind of uh, neck deep in that right now, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, so uh, I went to Sacred Heart University in Connecticut, uh, which is where I started getting into photography, although I, I grew up with an interest in it. Um, but the reason I mentioned I went to Sacred Heart is because so did Susan. So I'm class yes. of 94, and you're? Um, I'm class 2003. 2003, okay, yeah. so we just missed each other, yeah. right? <laughs> but it's actually kind of how we met. Um, uh, Susan almost stumbled on uh, oh, a photo sure. walk that we were doing at the Brooklyn Bridge last I was there year. at the same time, and I was yeah. trying to find them, and then I said, forget this, let me do my own photography. But I did follow up with you and say, hey, what a great night it was in Brooklyn Bridge Park. Yeah, and I'm kind of like, well, who's this emailing me? And I like, kind of looked at her background, and you went to Sacred Heart. Yeah. And so that kind of got the conversation rolling. And um, so now, you know, a year and a half after that, we're actually going to be doing a workshop together in Acadia in the fall, this coming fall. So, um, so yes, awesome. hoping it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but a little about you. Sure. So my name is Susan Magnano. I have a photography business called Magnanimous Pictures, and I do events and portraits and weddings and even some commercial work. Uh, some of my clients are Tribeca Film Festival and NFL, and um, I even work for the Food Network. I have another photography business, which is called Photor Adventures, which is the reason why I'm here today. Um, Photor Adventures is an adventure photography workshop where we take people out into nature and we teach them how to photograph the elements. Um, it's a unique experience where we combine people's excitement for exploring nature as well as um, bringing along professional photographers like Chris and I and teaching you how to capture those beautiful images and make um, epic images to bring home to your friends and family. So um, Chris and I have been talking for a while and we both love Acadia and uh, we're partnering up like Chris had said to do that and I just got back from scouting Acadia this past weekend and I cannot wait to talk about it. So. Um, Let's get started. And that was, was that was your fourth time there? Yes. Okay, and I've been there about 12 times. So that's 16 between the two of us for anybody who didn't have a calculator. Um, so uh, hopefully we can answer any questions you might have about, yeah. about the park. Um, but it's a really great park for photography. Um, it's one of the smallest national parks, yet it's in the top 10 in visitation. And despite being small, it's got so much for the photographer. There's so much variety in this tiny place in terms of photo subjects. And um, uh, we'll be showing you, hopefully we'll do a good job of showing that variety to you today. So what we're gonna talk about, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about scouting, um, primarily just in terms of how you can find even more information about shooting at Acadia. Uh, we're gonna talk about gear. We're not gonna get into everything that we use, but we're gonna talk about the um, some of the photo gear that's really conducive to the type of photography that you do in Acadia. And then the bulk of what we're going to talk about is the locations, the photo sites and the subjects. Uh, we're going to show you a whole bunch of photos from uh, the times that we've been there and tell you some stories. We'll mix in a little bit about how we did some of the images. Um, and then at the end, we can, we can take any questions. Great. So, um, OK, scouting. If, um, if you've read my book, or if you've seen me talk before, you know I'm huge on scouting. I'm always doing research about a location before I go. So if you're interested in photographing Acadia and you haven't been there before, then watching this presentation is an excellent first step, I hope. Uh, but there's also other resources, um, particularly apps. And we're going to talk about uh, some of the apps that we use to uh, do some research about locations in general, but also specifically about Acadia. Um, and also ones that you use on site to get even more information. So the first app is Chimani, um, and they're the sponsor today. Um, but we would be mentioning them even if they weren't sponsoring the presentation. It's uh, a really great resource for anybody who wants to visit a national park, uh, but for photographers in particular. 
So what Chimani does is they publish apps. Uh, they've got an app for every national park. It's a travel guide app. Uh, they're free. And what they did when they found it a few years back is they developed a technology that allowed all of the information to be self-contained in the app. So you don't need a mobile connection. You don't need a data connection to access it. Once it's on your phone or on your tablet, you can be in the middle of a national park with no cell signal and still access all the information in it. Uh, another great thing about the apps is they have photographers in mind. When they uh, started doing uh, the, uh, uh, I guess what they called the 2.0, when they were upgrading their apps for the first time and doing some research, they realized that photography was one of the top three activities practiced in the parks. I mean, everybody knows that you do camping and hiking there, but everybody brings a camera. Right? So Chimani realized this and they said, we've got to build photo information into these apps. So there's all the stuff like sunrise and sunset times and moon phases and uh, blue hour and uh, you know, the estimated times for golden hour. Uh, there's photography tips from photographers who frequent those parks and there's a lot of photos and location advice in the apps as well. Uh, so really great resource. They also happen to be based in Portland, Maine. So Acadia is their backyard park. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, I, I believe the CEO of Chimani, it's where he got the idea for the apps, was standing on top of Cadillac Mountain. He was mm -hmm. on his phone trying to get information and couldn't without a cell signal. And so these apps were kind of born, the idea was born at Acadia. Uh, so they really know the place. This is my first time using Chimani for our trip to Acadia, and I was overwhelmed with the amount of information there's on this app. So first thing you do is you download the Acadia app, and this is the first page that pops up. And if anyone says there's nothing to do in Acadia, all they have to do <laughs> is look at this app, because um, all these little pinpoints sort of are either scenic viewpoints, um, rest stops, bathrooms, hikes, trails, mountain views, and even there's a shuttle service. So. Um, I know it looks a little bit overwhelming, but you can zoom into the location that you're headed and sort of see like, hey, what's on this coastline? And you can actually read a little bit of history about um, a certain viewpoint or the mountain that you're about to hike, how many miles it is. So there's so much information to be found there. Another cool thing that they have at Chimani is trip planning. So um, they ask you a couple of questions like, what type of traveler are you? Are you solo? Are you with a family? What are you interested in, hiking or biking? And um, I kind of planned my whole trip for the weekend. I said I was interested in hiking and photography, and I'm a solo traveler. And these were a couple of the things that they recommended for me to do. So it's kind of cool to have like a travel guide uh, plan your trip for you based on their knowledge of the, the park. And if you're looking for some photo inspiration, they have a photo gallery and they'll tell you where each part of these locations are. So if you're like, hey, I really want to get a cool sunset, you could click on that image and it would tell you where the location is. So um, I'm excited to use this app for the next national parks I try out. In, in yeah. So they have them for all 59 national parks uh, and they're free to download, they're free to use. Uh, the, the way that Chimani makes money is they have this perks program, which is $29 a year, and it comes with discounts uh, for national parks travel. So a lot of the, uh, like the vendors in the area, um, you know, the restaurants in the area, things like that. Uh, national Parks at Night is actually part of the perks program. Um, and what we do is there's an e-book that, the that we wrote on night photography. The only way you can get it is through Chimani Perks. Um, so those are the kinds of uh, the thing. So all around, if you're interested in national parks and photography and researching them before you go, uh, this is one of the best resources out there. Um, so some of the other things that we use, uh, Photographer's Ephemeris uh, is always in my back pocket. Um, really great uh, app for figuring out what the sunlight or the moonlight or the Milky Way is going to look like at different times of day. So, you know, suppose I'm out scouting a location and right here, uh, this is a screenshot right from Acadia National Park. Uh, there's this trail. We'll show you some photos from this later, but there's a trail that goes up to the Bubbles, which are two mountain kind of rock formations in the park. Um, so standing up there, I can actually look at my tablet or my phone and get this view. So say I'm up there at you know, 12 in the afternoon when the light's bad, but I want to see what's the light going to look like uh, at sunset. I can see this line right here is telling me what angle the sun is going to be setting at, or what time it's going to be rising, what time the moon is going to rise and set. Um, all along the bottom is the times, 519 sunrise, moonrise at 7.56 p.m. All this is really valuable information that I can get standing right there. So I don't have to guess 
what the light's gonna look like six hours from now. I can just take a look at the app and find out. This is one I use, it's called PhotoPills. Um, there are so many cool things to do. I can only really glimpse, glim, take a glimpse at um, the ones that I use. But if you wanted to find out when the sun was going to set, it tells you the exact times that there'll be the golden hour, the sunset, the blue hour, and then twilight. And if you're going to try and find out when the moon is going to rise, it tells you the exact time of the moon and uh, what the what the um, if it's going to be a full moon or if it'll be a waning crescent. It tells you the the moon rise and then also when the moon will set. Um, those are just two of the many cool things PhotoPill does. My favorite thing is the augmented reality. Um, this is my house, and I was trying to see where the sun would set, and if I wanted to, the sun would be passing right through this window at 7 p.m. So you can be standing on a beach and use the augmented reality and kind of guide yourself to say, where is the sun going to be? Is it going to come across this way, or will it be behind the mountain? And they have the same thing for a nighttime shot. They also have a depth of field perspective. They also have a time lapse calculator. So we could spend all day talking about photo pills, but these are just a couple of the things that I yeah. use. Photo pills is powerful, um, but it's also have a steep learning curve. Yeah. The people who uh, run photo pills, they actually do workshops dedicated just to learning how to use their app. Uh, so that tells you a how powerful it is, and b how long it can take to learn how to really use it. Um, so, and this is a great feature. I love the augmented reality feature for scouting Milky Way photos mm -hmm. because you can, you know, in daylight, you can be there and be like, oh, I wonder if the Milky Way is going to be here and just kind of change the time on the screen. And you can hold the tablet right up to the scene and it's going to project where the Milky Way is going to be at different times of the night. So you can, you know, get your shot set up uh, in broad daylight while you're scouting. Uh, this is another one. Um, this is called um, Sun Surveyor. And you'll notice that these apps kind of do very similar things, uh, but with different graphical representations. I actually use all of these. These are all on my tablet and all on my phone. Um, and what, what I like about this is just this 3D rendering of how the sun and the moon and the Milky Way are going to move across the sky. So this is just I can have my tablet and just kind of hold it up. If I hold it up, I kind of get this view. If you put it down parallel to the ground, then it changes. It's 3D, and it, and it kind of shows you the arc in a different way. So it's um, kind of realistic to your positioning at the moment. And this is just showing me that the sun's going to be rising at 7 here, and it's gonna, that's the arc it's going to take through the sky. And you can see every hour exactly where it's going to be. And the same with the moon and then the Milky Way. Um, there are a lot of night photography apps. I just happen to use Starwalk. Um, this one is really good because it tells you what the constellations are going to be like, as well as where the Milky Way will be, where the stars, where the North Star will be, um, and you kind of just turn it on. I always kind of just use it when I'm out doing night photography and say, where is that Big Dipper? And then you kind of just take the phone and, and locate it in the sky. And There's a wealth of information to be had. Just if you're interested in astronomy, I'd say definitely download it. Uh, so another one, Tidegraph Pro. The reason that we're mentioning this is because Acadia being a coastal park, knowing the tides uh, can provide you some really great information. Uh, if you, uh, the, the tides in Acadia in a lot of spots can be pretty dramatic between low and high tide to the point where you might go out at noon, you know, in bad light, and you're just scouting locations. You say, oh, what a great photo. I'm going to come back here at 6 o'clock and shoot it. But it was low tide when you scouted, and you come back at high tide, and the place looks completely different. Mm -hmm. And the photo you wanted to do is impossible. So I always want to know, when I'm working at a coastal park, uh, I want to know the tides. Uh, so in this case, you know, if I wanted to shoot at Bar Harbor, and i um, scouting at noon, and I really love the way that everything looks, I know, OK, well, this is the next time that the water level is going to be the same. Um, and maybe it doesn't happen at the right time of day. So I know I'm going to be here a week, and I'll look day by day and see when the tide is right, when the light's going to be right. Uh, it can also be important for safety. Um, uh, just, you know, if uh, there's a couple spots in Acadia where you can walk out to an island at low tide. And uh, if you walk out at low tide, well, you can't get back at high tide. So you might get stuck overnight. <laughs> Again, just you know, it's good information to know, and it's nice to just have it drowning. in your pocket. Yeah, drowning and you know stuff like that. Stuck in the mud, stuck in the mud. sure. 
And then uh, there's uh, four books that I recommend checking out uh, that are about Acadia in particular. Um, <clears throat> so there's The Photographer's Guide to the Main Coast, which, as you would imagine, covers the entire coast. Uh, but a really good section of it is about Acadia. And if you're going to go up to Acadia, which, by the way, is not a long drive from here. You can get there in about eight hours. Um, so it's, you, know, you could certainly do it in a day. Um, but you know, take a look up and down the coast, too. It's such a beautiful place to spend some time and to do photography. Uh, the Photographer's Guide to Acadia, this might actually be my favorite one. It's only available as an e-book. It's by Michael Hudson, who um, is a British photographer. And uh, he's spent a ton of time in Acadia. I think just whenever he went on vacation, that's where he wanted to go. And he shot there for years and did this ebook a few years ago. The photos are beautiful. And uh, like I said, I've been there about 12 times, and he n knew some spots that I had no idea existed. Uh, so he's got some great ideas. Photographing Acadia National Park. This is a great one to pick up, too, um, by um, Co Colleen minyak Sperry. She was the artist in residence at Acadia three times. So she has a ton of experience. Uh, she had rangers helping her, locals helping her. Uh, she has, in terms of photography, she's got to be in the top of uh, photographers who really know the details and the ins and outs of everything about Acadia. So that's an excellent book. And then there's also The Photographer's Guide to Acadia National Park by Jerry and uh, Marcy Monkman. This is, I think, the oldest of the four books. Um, I, I remember reading this a while back. Um, and uh, again, just a lot of good insider information. They're based in Maine. Another thing to check out, this just came out, uh, this article on BNH Explora. Uh, it's the main driving guide from Mount Katahdin to Acadia National Park. Uh, and a bulk of the article is about Acadia. And uh, this just came out on B&H Explorer a few days ago. And I happen to be quoted in about half of it. Um, <laughs> but it, it was a really good article. Jill Waterman did it. Uh, I highly recommend checking that out, too. OK, so gear. Um, we're at B&H, so of course we want to <laughs> talk about this. Um, we're just going to talk a little bit about the cameras that we use and then, again, some of the equipment that's really conducive to the type of photography that we're doing at Acadia. So I shoot Canon. I have a 5D Mark IV, and I also use a 60 as a backup. I typically bring my 70 to 200, my 24 to 105, and my 17 to 50 are my prime travel lenses. I do typically throw a 100 macro in my bag on occasion, and um, my 24 to 70 I use for some star photography, especially the Rokino 14 millimeter I predominantly use for night photography as well. But um, it's a lot of lenses to bring, so typically I have to decide when am I shooting and what can I fit in my bag. But um, one day I'll have a Sherpa or a camel to come with me on my trails. An intern. Yeah, <laughs> intern. or you know, a camera boy who carries my bag. Um, but one day I'll have that. But as for now, I try and carry as many lenses as I could possibly use or the ones I just need for my trip with me. But this is uh, typically what's in my bag. So I'm Nikon. Um, so this presentation could turn into an argument between Susan and I. Um, but uh, I'm shooting with, depending on what I'm doing, D5, D3S, D810, um, all great cameras. And I kind of mix and match just kind of based on, on what I'm doing. Uh, if I'm doing night photography, I love the D5, uh, uh, the, the D810 as well. If I'm doing night photography, I usually have two cameras out. So I kind of set up one for a long exposure of star trails, then use the other one and go do some light painting or some other shorter exposure work. And again, as Susan mentioned, like when you're in Acadia, the, I don't want to beat it to death, but it's so true about the variety of subjects that you really can use your whole kit. So I'm kind of bringing everything. You know, some parks I travel to, I might leave the telephoto at home. But in Acadia, there's uses for it because there's birds there and there's islands and there's you know things that that, uh, that are just call for it. Um, and then you know right down to the 1424 and I'll do some wide angle work because the landscapes are great and the mountains and uh, the coastline and then the macro, the flowers and um, yeah and again you're, we're going to show you all this stuff coming up. Um, but really any gear you have with you just bring. You'll use it. <laughs> uh, some other gear, uh, tripod. I'm always shooting with a tripod. Uh, um, I'm a Manfrotto ambassador. I, I use the Gitzo 3541 LS. 
Uh, but I'm always, always, always shooting with a tripod. Uh, if you're not a tripod photographer, bring one to Acadia because there's just some photography up there that you might want to do <coughs> like on the coast if you want to do water motion, um, if you want to shoot in the fog or you know, low, low light in the foliage, kind of get in the forest. Uh, these are all situations where you're going to be using longer shutter speeds and you're going to want to have a tripod sure. with you. Um, so what, what tripod do you use? I have one that I'm not particularly fond of, and I want to put out the lesson by one that you actually invest a little bit more money in because I was doing a workshop in Iceland, and um, I previously had misplaced my uh, tripod that I loved on a workshop. Uh, I got left behind. So now I'm using kind of, you know, the it was a special deal, and I bought this tripod. I can't remember what the name of it is, but um, the wind was so strong in Iceland that like my tripod really was doing nothing. So I wish I would have invested a little bit more money and it's on my to-do list. Maybe I'll think about a Manfrotto, uh, but to buy- Oh, don't even think about it, just buy it. Okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've contracted this. So thing. yeah, so, uh, so I'd say invest in a good tripod, don't go cheap. Yeah, um, I read a great article. I wish I could remember who wrote it. I read this about eight years ago, this article that says, you know, if you're just starting out in photography, buy a good tripod now. Um, because you're going to anyway, so don't waste right. the money on the, the $100 one that you buy first and the $200 one that you buy second, because you're eventually going to buy the, the six or $800 or $1,000 one anyway, sure. so just get it over with and do it now and don't, you know, don't waste the money on the cheaper stuff. It's uh, a good lesson. <laughs> yeah, I thought it was a great article and it described my evolution with tripods right. perfectly. I'm um, still going through the evolution. Still going through it? <laughs> okay. Uh, so intervalometer or a remote shutter release, if you're doing any night photography or long exposure work, um, you're going to want either or or both. Uh, for the kind of work that I do, it, it, this is such an important piece of gear that I have three or four of them with me at a time. So again, I might be shooting multiple cameras at night, so I'm going to want more than one. But also if one breaks, uh, mm -hmm. I, I want backups. Um, and it happened to me uh, with National Parks at Night. We were doing a Creative Live video last year. And during the shoot in o Olympic National Park with Creative Live, I pulled out my intervalometer and it didn't work. Mm. Um, so and I got another one. Happen, right? Let me pull right out the backup. Moment. and huh? it always happens when you mostly need it. Like you're in the middle of like the epic scene. And right. you're like, did the battery die? And you kind of just have to fumble around. It's a good thing you had a backup. Yeah, and they're, they're not expensive. And it's the kind of thing where it's... You know, you might only use it for 10% of your photos, but right. for those 10%, that's the tool that does the job. So, uh, filters? Filters. So, I bring an array of filters with me. I'm a Lee filter user, and I have a neutral gradient filter, I have an 8 stop filter, I have a 6 stop filter, and I have a polarizer. And um, whenever I'm going out to do creative shots, I bring this collection with me. I know it kind of might, it may seem a little cumbersome, but I think it's well worth it because a lot of people can walk up to a scene and just take a picture, but it's the filters that can help you differentiate your pictures. By using an 8 stop in your tripod, you can get motion and blur and capture action. And by using the polarizer, you can get rid of reflections on the water. And we're going to show you all this, but I really do think to take your photography to the next level, filters will help you do that. Right. And, the, and the, again, we're talking about, we're trying to talk about gear that's conducive, you know, that you use for the kind of photography that's conducive to Acadia. And filters are absolutely right there because uh, you've got coastline, you've got you know, the polarizer is great for uh, reducing glare on the surface of the water, getting a bluer sky, uh, reducing glare on the foliage, so if you're up there shooting in the fall. Uh, and then the, the neutral densities. Uh, there's a couple waterfalls in the park, so if you want to slow down your exposure and blur the water, uh, same thing on the coastline. Uh, Susan's got that 8-stop ND. I've got a 10-stop. Uh, so you can, get, you can blur water in broad daylight. Uh, and we'll show you some examples of that sure. coming up. Um, bags, um, again, Acadia is not a huge park. It's not a Yellowstone. It's not the kind of place where you're going to go on a, a two-week backcountry trip. Uh, but the trails are fantastic. So uh, you can definitely shoot it from the car. You can drive around and cover a, lot of, cover a lot of the park by just getting out and doing some short walks. But there's some really great spots where you can go make a day hike as well. So it's good to have a good bag, um, a backpack. Uh, I use the Manfrotto Bumblebee backpack, um, you know, just to throw everything in that and then get out on the trail and find some nice spots alone, quiet. And, uh, and shoot. So what yeah. bag do you use? I have a low pro. A low pro? I used to use low pro. I really like their bags too. Um, 
And then flashes and flashlights. Uh, I don't ever use a flash. You you use flashes yeah, for... Yeah, I have a speed light that I typically bust out to freeze frames. Um, I use it in test mode um, to freeze some light painting pictures. I'll show you an example of that later. But um, I just carry one around. I, I do a lot of portraits, so I'm always kind of on the outlook of doing a portrait on the mountain. Okay. Um, so it's like standard equipment for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's not for me. So. Yeah. Because I, sh I shoot national parks and I shoot pro tennis and <laughs> I don't use a flash in either one. So, uh, but I do use flashlights because doing the night photography, uh, you using a flashlight to either help focus or to light paint something or even just to walk back from a location in the dark safely. But even if you're not even into night photography, you might you know, even go for a half mile hike to shoot sunset somewhere, it's gonna be dark when you're coming back. So it's good to have a flashlight on you uh, if for no other reason than just safety purposes in that kind of situation. Um, or if you're getting up early for sunrise, if you wanna right. shoot sunrise in, a, in Acadia in the summer, what time are you getting up? Four o'clock. Yeah. Uh, this, morning, this weekend I got up every day at four o'clock to drive somewhere and be there on the rock Ready went for the sun to rise at 5 a.m. Right. So again, so, flashlight. You're Milky finding Way your way in the dark. Milky Way comes out at midnight, so you know there was not much <laughs> sleeping time uh, this past weekend. Right. But it's worth it. <laughs> Uh, and then apparel, uh, just something to think about when shooting at Acadia uh, because the, you're on the coast and the weather can vary dramatically throughout the day. Uh, even being there in early fall, uh, there's been plenty of times I've been there where during the day I'm wearing shorts and a t-shirt and then at night I'm wearing jeans and a sweatshirt with a base layer and a coat on right. the same day. Uh, so you really want to think about your clothing uh, and what you're going to be wherein uh, you get rain and fog and mist, so definitely have a raincoat, uh, something waterproof to wear, um, layers. Yeah, layers. Uh, just being in July, I started out in shorts, and by the end of the day, I was kind of wearing a sweatshirt and, a, and long slacks, and bug spray is important, um, especially in the summer, but uh, yeah, I'd say I concur with everything you said. Yeah. Um, layers. The, uh, yeah, the, the layering is Larry's important when, important when you're out shooting. And also, I hate shooting in the rain, mm. but I do it because the photography is so good. So I always say, in fact, I think I was quoted in the Explorer article saying this, it's like, uh, I hate shooting in the rain, but I love having shot in the rain. Um, and it's, have you heard this term uh, type two fun? <laughs> I just learned this last year. So type two fun is something that's not fun while you're doing it, but you love to look back on it oh. and tell stories about it. So, oh, there was this one time, the weather was awful. <laughs> we had such a blast. No, you didn't, it was miserable. <laughs> that's how I feel about shooting in the rain sure. and shooting in the snow, but I have to go out and do it because the photo opportunities are so great. Um, so you're up at Acadia and the fog rolls in and some rain comes, you gotta stay out there shooting. Uh, and then footwear. Um, this is a huge one for me. I'm always telling people, get good shoes. If you're gonna be out in a national park, if you're gonna be on the trails, get some good trail shoes. You, know, you don't wanna be wearing flip flops or sneakers. Get something that's designed for that environment because you're carrying your gear around, right? Um, you're, you don't wanna fall and break a lens uh, right. or an arm, I guess, but for <laughs> me it's about the gear. Um, <laughs> And also, you want to really be focusing on, on the shoot, right? So a good, good trail shoes have a nice wide base. It makes it harder to roll your ankle. Uh, really good aggressive tread. Uh, this is a trail in Acadia. It's like, look at these roots. You know? This yeah, is you Susan's photo. Where, where is this? This is along the great, on the Long Pond. Okay. Long Pond um, Trail. And, okay, I mean, it's certainly navigable in daylight, right? But again, like, suppose you went out and shot at sunset, and then you're coming back on this at night, it would be really easy to roll an ankle, right? So right. good shoes, good trail shoes are gonna protect you in this. Uh, here's another one from Acadia. And uh, this cliff is about on a 50 to 80 feet and I'm kind of up on the edge of it. I want shoes with a really good aggressive tread because I don't wanna have to worry about slipping, right? Mm -hmm. I just wanna focus on the photography and not feel like I might right. fall off at any minute. Um, so good trail shoes, I'm like stuck to that to that rock there and uh, completely what comfortable. What kind of hat are you wearing there? What kind of hat am I wearing here? Anybody tell? <laughs> That's my B&A chat, right. I have a whole series of photos of me in different national parks with my B&H hat on. What kind of tripod is there? That's my 3541 LS, my get so. And I think I'm shooting with the D3S there. Okay, so photo sites and subjects. Um, Again, there's so much variety, and you'll see, we'll show you where the stuff is, um, 
and give you a sense of the kind of photo opportunities that await you in Acadia National Park. And for you guys, for your knowledge, you'll get a map like this when you arrive at the visitor center. So um, you can sort of match it up with what Chris has done here with the little stars. Yeah, um, so just to show you, go back. Uh, this is the main part of the park. This is uh, Mount Desert Island, it's spelled desert, but the locals pronounce it desert. Fine with me, I like dessert. <laughs> um, and the, uh, the uh, shaded area, that's where the park is. So the park doesn't take up the whole island, uh, which is actually good because that means there's other stuff here to shoot besides just the park, and we'll, we'll cover that. Um, and then there's also, there's a few islands in the park. Uh, there's Ilaho, which uh, you have to take a ferry to get out to. Um, but this is the primary spot. This is mostly where you're gonna be when you go there. Uh, so we're going to start with Cadillac Mountain. Sure. So Cadillac Mountain is um, one of the most iconic places in Acadia. It is a 1,500-foot uh, mountaintop, and it is the first place to see the sunrise between October and March. Um, this is a sunrise shot that I took. I love incorporating the human element into the pictures. And on this particular day, we are blessed with a beautiful sunrise. <laughs> Um, on the next day, it was not the same. Um, the sun never even got through the cloud bank. So on a day like this, I kind of challenged myself to think, how am I going to make an interesting shot? Uh, not really much of a sunrise, but let me see if I could work with the elements. And I challenge you all to do this as well. Um, at first, I found some pine trees and said, all right, that's some interesting framing, you know, but there's still not much happening. I found some onlookers who were also there to watch the sunrise, and you're definitely not going to be alone at Cadillac Mountain. It's one of the most uh, prime spots to watch the sunrise. Um, so why not use some people who are there watching as well? And there's a reason for that. It's because, so it's from October to March. Yep. It's the first spot in the U.S. to see the sun. Right. So sunrise. it's kind of famous for that. So people like to go and be, oh, I'm going to be the first person to see the sunrise in the U.S. today. So you're never alone up there. Never. No, I've been there in January for sunrise and there were other people up there. Mm -hmm. uh, another way to make your shot interesting is to look for other photographers. So I managed to catch this photographer in the corner of my shot. Uh, he too was searching for a good shot that morning. Um, and then I thought, you know what, maybe it's not all about the sun peeking through the clouds, maybe it's about the texture of the clouds. So um, some interesting striations here, interesting colors, interesting patterns. I kept working the image and eventually I got to this one. If you wait, along, uh, wait long enough, something will emerge and this is a shot that emerged. I love the mountains in the distance and the texture of the sky and the water kind of matching up. So um, sometimes you're not just looking for where the sun is rising. Let's look around you and see if you could find something interesting happening and utilizing some other elements to make your shot interesting. Uh, so another time I like to go up to Cadillac Mountain is if it's in the fog. Um, it's funny, every time I, I say mountain, I can almost hear uh, people watching online from the West Coast laughing at this 1,500 <laughs> foot mountain, right? But it's what we have in these coasts, right. it's what we have. Uh, so if you're at Acadia and you see, if you can't see the top of Cadillac Mountain because it's in the clouds, get up there right now, just go, because that means it's foggy up there. So whenever I see that happening, I'm right up the mountain and uh, wandering around. There's uh, trails up there that you can literally get lost on in the fog, uh, which is just a blast. Um, you know, I've spent time up there just carrying a camera and, and a tripod and walking around and not even really knowing where I am anymore um, because it's foggy. But I'm just having a blast, like just walking around shooting stuff like this. Um, and this gives you a good sense of what it looks like up there. So it's not just about the view. There's other things up there to shoot and kind of do some abstract work in conditions like this. Uh, it's also a good spot for sunset, and it's something we're going to come back to a couple times because as great as Acadia is for shooting sunrise, there's not a lot of good spots for shooting the sunset because most of your uh, access to the horizon is on the east side of the island. Uh, but one of the good spots to shoot sunset is from the top of Cadillac Mountain. Uh, we said, you know, people are always up there for sunrise. It's what it's known for. But you're on the top of a mountain, you know, with a 360 degree view. Uh, in the summer, the sun is setting right over Eagle Lake, and you can get some, some, really nice, some really nice views up here. I like to go, obviously, in the summer. There's a lot of people in the park, and people are going up there for sunset. 
and it can get crowded right around there. So I like to go down the trail just a little bit. If you go really just a few hundred yards, you get away from everybody and find a nice quiet spot. Mm -hmm. And that's where this is. This is about maybe a quarter mile down the trail. Again, right from the top of Cadillac Mountain. Also a great spot to shoot at night. Um, the, I love the boulders up there. There's all these glacial erratics. And I had actually scouted this one during the day and knew I was going to come back and shoot it. Uh, but stars are beautiful up there. And do some light painting of the rocks. And it's a really great spot. It gets quiet at night, too, and cold. <laughs> right. Not as cold as the mountains in the west, though. <laughs> I was in Rocky Mountain National Park just a couple weeks ago, right, in summer. And boy, was it cold at night in the mountains. I had, oh, yeah, I had uh, lots of layers on for that. All right, so another spot that Acadia is, of course, very well known for is the coast. Stunning, stunning coastline. Um, I told you I've been there 12 times, right? So we did, at National Parks at Night, we did our very first workshop was in Acadia in 2016. And we brought the group out there, and I've seen the coast a bunch of times, right? And so I'm used to it, and I know it's beautiful. So we brought the workshop out there, and I'm starting to talk and tell them, notice that nobody's listening to me. They're just all looking around. And it occurred to me, for a lot of these people, it was the first time there, right? So I just shut up for like five <laughs> minutes and let people look around, because it really is that stunning, the, um, the coastline there. Uh, there's a lot of access to the coast. Uh, the Loop Road, right along here, hugs the coast for a while. And it's some of the most beautiful coastline I've ever seen in all my travels. And what's exciting is along the park loop is also the um, coastal path, which is a walking path. It's about a two-mile path that you can take, and a lot of people do it. It's a gravel path and easy to walk. And the coolest part is you can abandon the path and walk down the cliffs to, to get a better view of the ocean. So there are a lot of little coves like this. And on this bright sun, on this sunny morning, I uh, walked to the cove. Um, and I came across this sunrise point and I kind of love the uh, geometric shapes coming in and pointing at this pillar. But I thought, well, I want to kind of see the sunrise. So I kept on walking and uh, this was uh, right around that pillar, um, these beautiful smooth rocks and I love the texture and actually seeing the sunrise. It is slippery, so I do remember wearing, I do bring your, your shoes, your sneakers and your hiking trail shoes, but also bring a headlamp because if you're gonna be trying to capture a sunrise, it is kind of dark and you don't wanna slip, uh, have slippery footing and, and see where you're walking. Um, when I turned around, I realized there was three other photographers uh, behind me. I hope uh, they did not mind that I walked into their shot. And if they did, they can just clone me out of it. Um, but uh, just be aware of uh, your surroundings. And obviously, they thought it was a good place to watch the sunrise as well. Sometimes I call Photoshop's clone tool, I call it the photographer removal tool. I like yeah. that. <laughs> so I'll just get rid of it. <laughs> I like that a lot. Uh, so this is up on Great Head, uh, which is this is probably my favorite spot to shoot at sunrise in Acadia. It's not hard to get to. It's about, I want to say about a 20 minute walk, a 20 minute hike to get to this spot. But all the times I've been there, I've been alone. Um, and it's, it's, it's really beautiful. You, you kind of get it come out on these cliffs. You've got about 270 degrees to work with so you can shoot the sunrise from one spot. You can shoot the cliffs in the sunrise light. In other spots you get like lobster boats that are going out from the morning in the, in, in the beautiful light. You can shoot out on the ocean. Uh, there's a lot of options of things to do out here. Uh, if you take, there's um, it's kind of a loop trail that goes uh, out on Great Head. It's actually, it's even kind of a figure eight. You can go down to Sand Beach from there, which is another spot that we've got a couple of photos to show you. Um, but if you take the trail that most people don't, you kind of park off in a different spot um, on the kind of on the west side of the head and take the trail I'm sorry on the east side of the head and you take the trail that kind of goes along the east of Great Head it dips into a really nice cove that you can go out and shoot in as well and it's another spot that I know I'm not the only person who knows it I'm just saying mm -hmm. I've never seen anybody else there so I'm always kind of looking for quiet spots to shoot um, which will come up again in the presentation. You're going to think I'm, I'm aloof or just don't like people because <laughs> I'm always looking for quiet spots. Uh, oh, you know, what, you know what I want to mention too here? This is a really good example of the tide change in Acadia because you can see where the water comes up 
you can imagine how different this photo would have looked at, at high tide. So this is in Monument Cove, uh, which is uh, pretty close to where Susan was shooting those photos that she showed before. Um, the thing about Monument Cove, and it's not in this photo, but there's a, uh, there's a rock formation uh, monolith that's right over to the right here. It's not a good photo, uh, it's not good to shoot it from this position, but there's a nice spot where you can kind of come over uh, to the left of here and you get this monolith with the cove behind it. Um, and then you get the shore stretching off in the background. Uh, and that's a really nice spot that, even though it's on the map, uh, a lot of people don't know about it. Um, you know, they kind of know this is a place called Monument Cove, but you wouldn't know about the rock formation unless you actually walked into there and found it. This is Otter Cliffs, um, shot from Boulder Beach, another just stunning spot to shoot. Uh, all kinds of weather. Uh, I've been there a bunch of times and uh, used the boulders as foreground interest. Uh, I loved this foggy day and I put, a, I put a polarizer on the lens to get rid of the glare from the boulders and it really brought out the color. Uh, another yeah. thing, when you come down here, it's not, so, you know, Susan mentioned from the ocean path, there's all these little kind of trails and ways to get down to the shore to find these little secluded spots. Uh, this one, you kind of have to walk down, there's some exposed roots and stuff. So you have to be careful getting down there. But you also have to be careful when you are down there. These boulders are huge, but you'd be surprised at how many of them move. Like mm -hmm. you're walking around and it feels nice and stable, but even a boulder this size, if it's just positioned right and the rocks under it, it just moves underneath you. And so there's been times I'm walking and, I, and all of a sudden this giant thing just, you know. Um, so you have to be careful when you're down there. I don't know if I'm the only one who does this, but I use my tripod as a walking stick sometimes. Oh, sure, yeah. So it's like you kind of like use it to stabilize yourself as you're walking along the, a rocky surface. Right. It's also, you know what I love about down here is uh, if you're here when the tide's coming in, and you hear all the boulders kind of rolling over each uh, other. Yeah. So it's That's really distinct noise, yeah. yeah. The rumbling. So this is a Little Hunter Beach, uh, which is another spot that, this is actually hard to see from the road. But again, if you're on that ocean path, if you're out working, uh, walking, you'd see the spot where you can kind of hike down. And again, it's just one of these little spots, these little uh, hideaways where you can get down and shoot. And then the weather, the weather, you know, out shooting in the rain, miserable experience, but you know. Um, I'm always looking for weather along the coast. Uh, you can really get some dramatic waves down there. You got a storm and the tide coming in at the same time. It's, it's just stunning. This is at Sand Beach. Um, if you go all the way to the end of Sand Beach, uh, you find this like this patch of rocks as you get closer to the cliffs. You can use this foreground interest there. Um, this is a spot I came across when I was hiking with my friend along the coast. And um, originally I took it with my iPhone because I was like, hey, what a cool pan out. And then I realized I had this really expensive camera in my bag. I should shoot it with this. And I did. And I actually never put it together till uh, I put this presentation together. So thank you, Lightroom, for making it so easy uh, to stitch together pictures now. I feel like for a while I was thwarted by the idea of putting it into Photoshop and stitching it all together. And now every time I do a panel, I kind of do it right at the moment. Um, so, so make sure if you take that panel with your iPhone that you go ahead and you take it with your real camera too. Because uh, if you do use your Adobe products and use your Lightroom, it's super easy to stitch them together now. How many, how many people have in the past, been in a spot where this would be a cool pano, and you shoot it and then never put it together. I've got, I have more like that than ones that I've actually put together. Right. Uh, but Susan's absolutely right. Lightroom makes it so easy now. There's that, no excuses. Right. So I've been, uh, <laughs> you know, times when I've had to go back in my catalog to pull out photos and I've seen, oh, I shot this pano and I never put it together. Now in Lightroom, I go, oh, why don't you just do it quick and see how it came out. Right. Yeah. Um, this is another shot I was queuing up to photograph the cliff, 
And as I'm queuing it up, in comes this rock climber. And at first I was like, what the heck? And then I was like, hey, I kind of like it. So um, it wasn't intentional, but I like adding a human element to my shots. And this guy kind of screams adventure. And um, he was about, he had like a whole family with him that he was teaching how to rock climb. And they were rock climbing up and down these cliffs, which is a really fun thing to do in Acadia as well. So um, look out for these kind of opportunities. They might not seem like what you wanted in, in the first place, but they might actually turn out to be a happy surprise. See, now I don't want people in my photos. I would have pushed them off. <laughs> Get out of my shot. He would have been OK, because he had a rope. Yeah. He would have lassoed himself up. Um, Another thing I like to do with my coastal pictures is long exposures. I have an eight stop filter and I just love the way water looks when it's in motion. So it's great when you get the waves crashing but and you get the sharpness of the waves. Um, but I kind of like this ghostly look that happens. And what it is is a, my neutral density filter on my lens and I do a 30 second exposure. So that's what this one is. It's a 30 second exposure at 100 ISO, I think at F16. And um, it looked fine when it was just the water being normal, but I think it kind of looks cool with this ghostly effect of the long exposure. You get the motion in the clouds too. Yeah, nice. you see the motion in the clouds. Um, I did a similar thing in the, this uh, next three shots and I just kind of wanted to take you through my thought process. Um, it, this is sunrise, uh, which is not what you would think, but this was sunrise on the cliffs and I kind of showed up and this is my first shot. You see the water um, on the coast and it's okay. And then I put my eight stop filter on and I ended up getting this one. Uh, this is a 10 second exposure and I thought, hey, that's really interesting. What would it look like if I did a longer exposure? So then I did a 30 second exposure. So after going back and forth, um, I kind of settled on liking the 10 stop just a little bit more because there's a little bit more definition in the water. And another thing that's interesting to look at is since the fog was rolling in, if you look at the mountainscape in the background, you can see how it appears and uh, disappears and shows off different parts. So if there's fog rolling in, make sure you keep on shooting because it ends up being a really cool effect. Yeah, because when you're kind of when you're shooting in fog, it looks very static. Um, but if you just stop and look, it is moving. So. Uh, a shot that might not work one minute could work the next minute because the fog is actually moving, as you can just see, and uh, revealing and hiding things as it passes through the landscape. So I would say definitely break out your 8-stop or your ND filters to try and get some movement in water. Um, this was the same morning I was looking for another beach to check out along the coast and I came across this really cool wooded steps and I love the angles and the, um, the angles of the, the, you know, the steps and the um, banisters as it went, led down to the beach and something to look at is just leading lines. So um, I thought this shot was really interesting uh, on my walk to the beach. Yeah. What I like about this, and we'll re revisit this theme a bit too, is uh, when you're shooting someplace, in a lot of these spots, there's the really obvious subject. You're on the coast. The obvious subject is to shoot the coast, but to keep your eyes open for other possibilities as well. And you did a great job finding something a little different to shoot there. And this is what I found down on that beach. It is a Kieran. Kieran is a Kieran. Kieran? Yeah. Um, a bunch of rocks stacked together, kind of distinguishing this is the way of the trail. And I kind of love the textures. This picture is all about the textures of the rocks and the rocks behind it, and even the rocks on the foreground on a nice foggy morning. So, you know, really focus on the details as well as the big wide landscapes. Yeah. You find a lot of Cairns at Acadia to the point where they really are a part of the character of the park. Uh, a lot of them have been around for a long time because that's how they mark the trails. The trails go across, you know, these granite boulder landscapes. Uh, and so that's how they marked the trail. Um, unfortunately, a lot of people have saw that, but well, that's cool, I'm going to build one too. So there's a bunch that don't mark trails, um, and the, the park actually would prefer that people don't do that uh, mm -hmm. so that they can keep the, you know, the real ones, the trail markers, clear. Uh, but when you go to Acadia, you see them all over the place. Uh, so, of course, night is another great time to be down at the coast. Uh, this is Monument Cove that I mentioned before, but you can't see the monument because it's kind of blending in uh, to the background. Uh, you'd have to shoot it from this side and shoot back. Um, but Acadia is a great night photography location, which you might not think exists on the East Coast for good reason. 
Uh, but uh, uh, over the last year and a half, uh, I've talked with Tyler Nordgren a couple of times. He's an astronomer based on the West Coast, and he's the author of the book um, that's uh, Astronomy in the National Parks. Uh, he also is a night photographer. He took a, he used to work for the Navy, and he took a one-year sabbatical. And all he did for a year was travel to national parks and shoot night photos. Uh, and that's also when he started working on the book. Uh, so he's got a lot of experience in the parks doing this. And Acadia, he's an astronomer, right? Acadia is his favorite national park for night. Um, it's not the darkest skies. It's not the dark skies that you find in the southwest deserts. But what it has going for it is that the communities in the area are very respectful of the idea of not committing the sin of light pollution, right? So they don't have a lot of lights and not a, lot, a lot of needless night lights that are shining at night. Uh, the lamp posts, you know, tend to face down so they're not uh, throwing light up into the air. So you can get a really, um, really nice night skies uh, in Acadia. Uh, something else I'll point out here. Uh, so Susan was showing the long exposures before, uh, doing like a 30 second exposure using um, a, a, an eight stop neutral density filter. Another advantage of that, actually, let me go back to, this isn't the perfect example of it. Let's go. Okay, so this is a good example. If you were shooting this with, uh, without a filter and using just maybe a 30 second exposure, you're gonna not get a lot of wave action, right? Because there might be a wave breaking here or a wave breaking here, you know, maybe in two or three spots. And now that becomes just a little spot of white in your landscape that becomes more of a distraction than anything that helps the composition. But in this long exposure, you're getting waves breaking everywhere. How long was this? 30 seconds. 30 seconds, right? So the waves are rolling in and creating all this nice uh, light-toned compositional element that really helps uh, portray the, uh, the sense of the scene, the environment. Uh, that you wouldn't get with a faster exposure. So I was going for the same thing here, um, but the tide was going out. I didn't have quite the same wave action. And I really wanted a lot of waves breaking along the line of the coast. But I could only do a 20 second exposure because anything longer than that, and my stars would have been moving. I didn't want star trails. I wanted star points. And I tried for about 45 minutes to get a photo where the waves were all breaking in the spots I wanted at the right time, and I couldn't get it. So eventually what I did, there were three spots that were important to me. I wanted waves breaking here, I wanted waves breaking in the background, and I wanted waves breaking on the shore, just to bring some definition to that. So what I ended up doing is taking three photos where they were breaking where I wanted them, and I layered them together in Photoshop. Also along the coast, um, you can just kind of make out the Milky Way rising, um, just a tiny bit of light painting up in the foreground just to bring out some detail. And then this is back at Sand Beach. That's the beehive, right? That's the beehive in the background, yeah. I love shooting the, the beehive from Sand Beach because there's mm. this little stream that right. kind of a nice yeah. S-curve off toward the mountain in the background. Okay, so the Jessup Path. Um, so we've talked about mountains, we've talked about coastline. There's also some great forests in Acadia, including both birches and aspen. I love shooting the birches and aspen, and the Jessup Path is one of the best places to do it. You can find birch groves in different spots of the park, uh, but this is probably my favorite one to shoot. Um, so the Jessup Path starts as a boardwalk, and it's really beautiful. I wanna say it's a quarter mile long, uh, it seems a little long, it might be a little shorter than that, uh, that walks through this birch grove. Um, there's frogs in there, there's birds, you can photograph woodpeckers in here. Uh, it's very much a, an exercise in making order out of chaos. Uh, you can really do some beautiful work in here in a nice quiet spot. Uh, you can do some detail work. Uh, a lot of opportunities. You, if it's overcast, this is one of the best places in the park to go. Um, it gets a nice soft light under the trees. I think it's also an interesting point to work on composition. So if you go back to the previous picture, 
you know, you have all these beautiful trees, how do you compose an interesting shot? So yeah. it challenges you to really look at your subject and do something interesting compositionally. Yeah, you really could. If you get a nice overcast day, you could spend the whole day in this area shooting different stuff. So I showed you that boardwalk. Uh, most people who go to this part of the park walk to the end of the boardwalk. I'm like, that oh, was really beautiful. Yeah, okay, then they turn around and they walk back. So most people don't know about this spot, even though it's right in the same area. If you get to the end of the boardwalk, um, you kind of cup across a junction of a trail, and you turn right, you only have to walk about 30 feet, and you come across this beautiful tunnel of birches. Um, so you can see the trail just going right through here. And I shoot here all the time in different seasons and different weather. Um, this was just one time, it was like the fifth time I shot there. I'm like, what can I do that's different? And just kind of played with some zoom blur. So this is just zooming the lens in the middle of the exposure. And then last year I realized uh, I have never shot this at night. So um, I set up and I just got, uh, uh, the way I light painted this was I had two flashlights and I held them like this, one pointing up and one pointing down. And with my back to the camera, I just walked down the trail. Really beautiful spot to shoot. And then uh, when you come off the Jessup Path, uh, it comes right out onto the Park Loop Road. And if you go across the road from there, there's some just huge groves of, of birches there. You can walk around and um, do stuff like this. It's a really, really beautiful area to shoot. <laughs> the mountain trails, they're all over the park. <laughs> Um, so again, uh, Acadia is not the kind of place where you're going to go on a two-week backcountry trip, but there are beautiful trails uh, to get up into the mountains, and once you get up on top, you can uh, get some nice sights uh, of the coast, looking down on the coastline and the coastal islands. Just to be specific, there's 120 miles of hiking trails there, so just for you guys avid hikers, it's the best place to go. And I think the best time to go is in the fall. Because it's like a kaleidoscope of colors, um, as you'll see, uh, these trails give you the best views of the surrounding areas and the mountains. I believe this is the Beehive Trail, which is a really challenging trail. It's about a 0.8 hike up a cliffside facade, and there's iron ladders for you to climb up. So if you're an adventurous person, I would say do it. If you're afraid of the heights, don't do it. Um, but uh, the views are spectacular, and it's worth a little bit of death-defying hiking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Not here. the kind of trail you do with the gear in your hands. Right, I'd say like go with a small pack and put your tripod away. You need both hands to climb up, uh, but it's way worth it. Um, this is another view from the Beehive Trail. I just love the colors and uh, the really moody sky. And this is Oops. just a. Go back. So this is Sand Beach right here, and this is Great Head. Just to give you some perspective about where we are. Sure. Um, um, something that you can never escape in your pictures of Acadia are rocks. Rocks are everywhere, even on the top of the mountains. And I kind of love the texture of the rocks and the bushes, the colorful bushes leading into the landscape and the ocean view. What kind of bushes are those? Oh, my favorite. <laughs> uh, low bush blueberry. Um, so blueberry is my favorite fruit, um, and I. So in in Acadia, it's pretty much the same in most of the parks. If you come across berries, you know, fruiting trees, you can pick them and eat them. You can't harvest them and bring them out of the park and sell them, but you can eat as much as you want. So I love coming here in the summer. Uh, a couple years ago, I was here with my friend Steve, who's a photographer based in New York. He's a, a sports photographer for Newsday and Getty. And I, he was so good about not complaining about how often I was stopping and picking blueberries. We'd be mm -hmm. hiking, and I'd stop every you know, mm -hmm. 20 feet and then pick some more. That was like <laughs> half of what I put in my stomach that whole week. <laughs> and then in the fall, they just turned this like fire red. Um, it's just, you know, they carpet the landscape in some areas, and they're really stunning to shoot. So really look for them to add some color and splashes to your pictures. Um, I really hope that they're in bloom like that when we do our workshop in October. Really. Yeah. Well, good thing about these is, um, you know, like some of the trees, they, they turn color and then the, the leaves are gone, you know, in like seven to ten days. The low bush blueberry, they stay red for a while, so okay, we great. should luck out. 
Uh, here is one more view. I love the rock cropping in the foreground and the mountain and the splashes of color in the distance. I mean, everywhere you look in the fall, in the autumn of Acadia, it's just a spectacular color everywhere. I thought New York was good for fall foliage until I went to Maine, and now I'm kind of a little spoiled and want to go back to Maine. It's yeah. Really I'd say well, Acadia is probably the best national park for fall foliage. And some heavy competition, too. Yeah, yeah. totally. Um, so on the, on the west side of the island, uh, which they call the quiet side, is the, uh, the east side has Bar Harbor, which is the touristy area. Um, the west side of the island, they say the quiet side, because that's mostly locals who live over there. So even though half the park is over there, uh, far fewer people visit that side. Uh, one of the really great hikes in the park is on that side of the island, and that's up to the top of Acadia Mountain. Um, and this is right here, you're kind of overlooking Somme Sound, uh, which they used to say is a fjord, but apparently geologists say, no, it's not a fjord. So now they call it a fjord-like body of water. <laughs> <laughs> so that's Somme Sound here, and then you know, going out into the ocean, and you get this really great view of all the islands back there. Um, this was a, a, a case like uh, Susan was talking about before when she was up in Cadillac Mountain last week, uh, where I was up there, I hiked up there for sunrise and didn't really get a sunrise. Uh, but I just sat there alone for a while and enjoyed the view. Um, you know, I put myself in the photo just for <laughs> some perspective. Um, and it's a, really, it's a really stunning spot. Eventually I did get some company up there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, as a woman came, came up walking her dog. Uh, she was a local. She lived on the island forever, and we had a really nice, long conversation. I learned some, some new things about the park and um, got to spend time with her dog. And uh, then she left, and I was, you know, playing around again. Um, and uh, I don't know if I'm jumping for joy or jumping off or, or what. Uh, but either way, Susan's much better at it than I am. So. so yeah, funny enough, we both jumped in the same spot on different trips. When he showed me that picture, I said, oh my god, I jumped at the top of Acadia Mountain too. So when you guys go to this mountaintop, we expect you to all send us pictures of you yes. jumping. It's just, I think we should all go as a group <laughs> and do a group, and do a jump. group photo <laughs> jumping up. Uh, so this is another photo. I, I, it's... So the reason I'm showing this is because, you know, I was up there, I was like, oh, I gotta do some photos uh, because I hiked up there and the light's not good, but I'm gonna do something. Sometimes I shoot just because I'm like, well, I've got a composition I like and the light's not right, but maybe someday I can do something with it. And this is kind of an example of that because this was before Lightroom had the dehaze filter. Uh, I tried playing with this and couldn't come up with anything I really liked, but then after the dehaze filter came out, this is one of the photos. Like, oh, I wanna go back and see if I could do anything with that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, still not my favorite shot of Acadia, but now I can actually make something out of it. Uh, so it's just worth doing that sometimes. You know, I like the shot, but I know I can't fix it in post, but let's just shoot it anyway and see what happens in five years. Uh, and then again, just not shooting the obvious. You're up on top of Acadia Mountain, and you got these gorgeous views, and that's the obvious stuff to shoot. Uh, but along the trail, you find other things as well. This nice little grove of trees along the along the boulders. I, I spent some time here. Uh, this is a shot I photographed from the top of Pensacob. What did you say? Oh, Penobscot Mountain. Penobscot Mountain. Yeah. Um, it was also a sunset that was mediocre, but I loved the layers that were created by the sunset. Um, it reminded me of the Smoky Mountains. Uh, Chris and I will also be doing the Smoky Mountain workshop in the spring. I hope we get views like this, but um, it was maybe not the ideal sunset picture, but I just couldn't get over the layers uh, that were created by the setting sun. Uh, this tree reminded me of a tree I saw in Charlie Brown's Christmas special. Uh, <laughs> it was lonely and like half teetering on life and death and it was just in front of this miraculous view and I said well this tree is still lucky to be alive and it's still holding up uh, with one arm or one side and um, it kind of felt like how I felt after I hiked that whole mountain like kind of like a little bit <laughs> not right but uh, I kind of uh, connected with this tree and thought it was an interesting uh, foreground for the sunset in the back. All right, so Jordan Pond. Uh, this is another one of those iconic spots in the park uh, for not just photographers, but 
you know, for anybody who's visiting Acadia. Um, the Jordan Pond House is one of the only places to eat in Acadia, so I definitely recommend you make a stop over to them. Um, one of their famous foods is a popover, which is a delicious pastry um, where you <laughs> smother it with butter and jam, and uh, it's crispy and crunchy and exactly what you need after a day of hiking and shooting. My preference is it with ice cream on top of it. So um, this is definitely a worth a stopover for a popover <laughs> um, at the Jordan Pond House. Uh, another thing you could do when you get to the Jordan Pond House is go for a hike. So these are the Bubbles, which are the iconic mountain range of Acadia. Uh, they're north and south Bubbles. Uh, they form these little humps. And um, the challenge when you get to the Jordan Pond House is how do I take a creative picture with the Bubbles with all these interesting rock formations? So um, you'll just see all photographers getting low, getting high, moving close to the rocks, moving away. And you're just kind of working on composition uh, and trying to get an interesting composition with all the, all the elements. Yeah, so the, the, the bubbles uh, very much define most of the, the scene at Jordan Pond. Um, it, it's just such an obvious thing to shoot. Uh, and like Susan said, a lot of what you do there is try to find new ways to shoot it. Uh, uh, working along the, the south shore of the pond, you get so many different views of it. Uh, this was one where, I, this might be the only time I ever just zoomed in and shot just the bubbles. <laughs> and the reason I did is because I was there in the fall, but I was, a, uh, I was a little past peak and the color was sparse. And a good way to solve that problem is to use a telephoto lens to hone in on the color that you can find. And uh, there was color dotting the bubbles. And I was like, all right, so there's my photo. Uh, and then this is a winter photo. Um, Acadia is very underrated as a winter destination. It's beautiful in the winter. Uh, they, they get a fair amount of snow. Uh, it tends to melt in a couple of days because it is on the coast. Uh, but you can go spend a week up there in the winter and it's probably going to snow. And it's beautiful and it's quiet. Uh, so I spent a half day at Jordan Pond in January a few years ago and didn't see one person the hmm. whole time. Um, you're really going to think I hate people. but. <laughs> Besides us uh, eating uh, popovers at the Jordan Pond House, you can go for the trail walk, which is about two point or three point two miles around the lake, uh, around the pond. Um, it has these beautiful little paths. It's a really easy trail, and once you start heading around the lake, you'll notice that not that many people do it. I mean, they start off and I guess they turn around. Maybe they want more popovers, I'm not sure. But um, when you get around the lake, you're kind of by yourself. At least that's been my experience. Yeah, absolutely. Um... The, so, so we said like the bubbles are like the obvious thing to shoot there, right? Um, but we've also talked about looking past the obvious, and a good way to do that at Jordan Pond is to hike that trail. It's not a hard trail. Um, it's three miles, but it's almost all level. There's one spot where you've got to kind of go over the rocks on the shore. But other than that, you, I mean, this is what the trail looks like. Um, right. You get the boardwalk. This is on the west side of the pond. Uh, but it brings you, to, brings you to a lot of other opportunities for things to shoot. shoot. So this is of Jordan Pond, but a different angle. Right, so the bubbles aren't in the shot, um, which is just as interesting, you know? You got a little cloud rolling in, you got some reflections, and once again, you're trying to frame the rocks in a creative manner. So this is in winter. This was on that day that I spent there. Uh, I hiked the whole trail that day, um, just shooting and being alone. Uh, and then it was funny, I liked this composition. Uh, I liked kind of the, the S-curve of the rocks going into the background. And I had this idea, I knew I was coming back in the fall, I said, I want to do this exact same photo in the fall with the color. And I was planning this for nine months, right? And I finally get back there in October when I realized I was standing on ice. <laughs> I can't do this photo. <laughs> so I ended up yeah, doing this instead. Have your on. <laughs> yeah, gotta have swimmers on, bring some waders or something. Um, but this is what I ended up with after realizing that my plan was futile. <laughs> and then again, just walking around the pond, finding different stuff to shoot. And some detail work. So Susan was talking before about how people start in the trail and then go back. Right here in this point, that's where most people go back. 
I'd say 99 out of 100 people who walk on the trail get out to that point and then they go back toward the Jordan Pond house. And one of my favorite spots to shoot is just like another 100 yards down. Right. Uh, so the trail comes along here. I heard an haha. Somebody knows this spot? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you come down and uh, the trail goes over a little walking bridge and you get views up kind of two shorelines. Uh, it's very quiet. The water's very still because it's kind of in this little cove. If you turn behind you, there's this little stream coming through a marsh that em uh, empties into the lake. Uh, that's very pretty. Uh, this is a good example, too, of a spot that the first time I found it, the light was terrible. And I marked it on the map, and it was a few years before I had the right weather to shoot it. Like, I always thought fog was going to be the best time. I've also tried shooting this location, and I had unsuccessful pictures, too, so I'm glad you got it. <laughs> yeah, you need fog. <laughs> I even tried it in winter, and even in winter, it was just too sparse. Uh, and then right again in the same area, uh, I mean, these th three photos I just showed you were all shot within about maybe 50 yards of each other. Um, uh, and this was just, this was, it was a little darker than it looks here. This was kind of late into dusk, uh, long exposure. This is a shot I photographed um, after sunset. The sun had just set, and uh, I was walking back around the lake, and I just love the shapes. I mean, I just look at this one, and I say, oh, my God, the shape of the bubble, the shape of the rock. It kind of looks like they're fitting together like puzzle pieces. Um, and I thought, oh, what could I do to make it a little bit different after I got this shot? So I did some light painting. I moved over, and there was a bunch more rocks. Um, and I decided, let me try and light painting them. So I use a video light. Um, I'm very low and uh, painted in some lights, and I don't really know which one I like better. Um, love to hear what you guys think, but um, just a cool experience to see how different, um, just by adding a little bit of light, um, you can change your foreground. Oh, another night photo from Jordan Pond. Um, I had actually, I, this was on the trip with my, with my friend Steve, and I was done shooting. I'd already packed up my stuff and was ready to go back to the car for the night. I was done. And then Steve said, oh, the Big Dipper. And I'm like, yeah, all right. <laughs> I unpacked and uh, spent like another hour there. Um, and then I ended up, this might have been my favorite photo from that trip. Uh, and the rocks, I actually was going to light paint them and then decided that the moonlight was already doing the job for me. Uh, I showed you the photo pills screenshot before. Uh, I had actually, not photo pills, but photographer's ephemeris. I had actually used that and knew exactly where the moon was going to be coming up over Jordan Pond that night. And um, by the time we were setting up for this shot, the moon was rising. And I was like, you know, that looks pretty good. So that's all lit by moonlight right there. So I came to Jordan Pond hoping to get the Big Dipper, but I was not as fortunate. Um, I was uh, faced with a lot of cloud cover, which still led to an interesting picture. This is when you're challenged to be more of a creative photographer. So um, it was just really me. I didn't have anyone else to light paint or make into an interesting composition. So I found these three Adirondack chairs, which are part of the Jordan Pond House's like, iconic sort of seating area. And um, what I did was, I, they were kind of positioned there already. I didn't really move them. And I saw that the bubbles were in the distance. And I used my Canon speed light um, and bent down below. I sent it on a long exposure. I walked in front and I shot off one test shot um, to illuminate the chairs. So, um, so this is a, how to make a creative shot. Even if you don't have stars, you can still do something creative. It challenges you to be a better photographer if the setting is not right. You know the Nikon speed light's better, right? Hey, hey, hey. I don't know about that. <laughs> All right, we'll talk about Mac and PC instead. Do you want yeah. to? <laughs> I know. I'm a Mac. He's a PC. I don't yes. know what's going Which on. Which we didn't know until we were putting the presentation together. She's like, you use a PC? Like, <laughs> I'm an iPhone. You're an Android. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're complete yeah. opposites. I don't yeah. know how we just went to the same school. In the same room together. Yeah. Um, all right, so the carriage roads and bridges. Uh, Acadia has this network of carriage roads that uh, Rockefeller built. Um, uh, he spent a lot of time in the area and loved the park, and he wanted, that was like his donation to the park, is he um, built this network of packed gravel roads uh, to help people get around. So back in the day, you know, people would use uh, a horse and buggy to go through the park this way, uh, which you can still do. Susan's going to talk about in a second. 
So I fell in love with the carriage roads the first time I found them because it makes it so easy to get to different parts of the park. There's been some times that I've gone to Acadia to shoot and brought my bike with me because the carriage roads, you, you can bring a bike on it, you can ride a horse, um, and I can just hop on my bike and be to a location in five minutes that might take me half an hour to hike to. Mm -hmm. now, I don't mind the half hour hike, but if I'm trying to get a lot done, I'm right. cutting that 25 minutes out of the schedule during good light, that can be pretty valuable, right? So just hop on the bike and, you know, run up to, uh, you know, a pond along the trail roads or something, uh, the carriage roads. But another great thing about the carriage roads is they're a good photography subject. Uh, they blend in with the environment really well, especially the bridges. There are seven, along the network of roads, there are 17 stone bridges, each with a unique design uh, that fits so well into the landscape that they're just, they're a wonderful photo subject. Um, there are two, this is a gatehouse, there's two of them in the park, one on the east side of the road system, one on the west side. As they built them around the same time the roads were built and then barely used them, so now they're just kind of decorative. There's also the horse and carriage rides that you can go on. Um, we're thinking of possibly renting a horse and carriage for a photo shoot when we do our workshop in October. I think it's kind of cool to see them walk around and maybe we could get someone to dress up in an old timey outfit. Or maybe you can do that, Chris. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's another way to get around the park it's on horseback or horse and carriage. Yeah. So the stables are right there at the- Yeah, uh, the Wildwood the, the stables. Right near Jordan, the Jordan, Jordan Pond, Pond House, House, actually. So I actually, um, I don't know how many times I'm gonna mention Steve. I've been there 12 times since like all the stories are from that trip. <laughs> uh, so Steve and I hiked out to Cobblestone Bridge, which, um, well, we're gonna get to it in a minute. And so quiet, it's like a 40 minute walk in the carriage roads and we're out in the middle of the woods and we're getting set up to shoot. And all of a sudden there's all this noise and people, it's, where do these people come from? There's two carriages full right. of people who got off as we're about to start shooting. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Tourists. <laughs> so uh, along the carriage trails, you can rent bikes, but you actually rent them down in Bar Harbor, and then you take a shuttle system over. Um, at least that's been my experience. You can't really rent a bike in the park, but it's just a quick little shuttle service, and they'll drop you off at a bunch of different locations and also pick you up. Um, like uh, Chris was saying, it's one of the faster ways to get through the carriage trail and see the most. Um, so this is just a picture from my last biking experience. There are lots of hills, so be prepared. Uh, I remember my yeah. legs were screaming at the end of that, uh, but it was very fun. The, uh, the shuttle service, I'm glad you mentioned that, because it's, uh, it's a really nice shuttle service that will bring you to most spots in the park, and it's free, it's donated by L.L. Bean, which is uh, based in Maine. Um, and I think they're propane-fueled shuttles. Uh, so environmentally friendly, um, and uh, so that's another good way to get around. It's a very easy park to get around. Mm -hmm. So this is the uh, Stanley Brook Bridge, which is one of my favorite bridges to shoot, despite there being a road, paved road running through it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I love the three arches. There's a, uh, one of the trails goes through one of those arches, and there's a stream that goes through another one. Um, it's, it's a relatively easy bridge to get to because it's on the road, so you can just you can drive and just pull over and start shooting. Uh, I like to get up on carriage road level and, and shoot from up there. This was, again, shooting in the rain, so not fun, but I'm glad I did it. <laughs> and then I shot at night, so this looks like the same. This is actually two different sides of the bridge. Oh. So when we did our night photography workshop there last year, uh, we brought the group to Stanley Brook Bridge one night and I was like, well, I've never shot this at night. But I don't shoot during the workshop, so I'm thinking, all right, I'm gonna stay a couple days after the workshop, and I'm gonna come back and do something. You know, I remember that composition I did a, a few years earlier that I just showed you, and I do something similar to that. So I get up there, and it had been overcast all day, and I get the tripod set up, I get my composition, it's pitch black out, because it's a new moon and it's overcast. So there's absolutely no light to work with. Um, uh, so I always say with night photography, you gotta scout your shot in daylight when you can actually see. 
so I did know what the photo I was going to do. I had stopped during the day, and I knew exactly what composition I wanted to set up. I had it all set up. I figured out all my light painting, and then it starts pouring. And I'm getting wet. But I'm already set up, right? So I'm going to do the shot. <laughs> My philosophy with rain is that if I'm already wet, I may as well just stay out, right? Because it's not going to get worse, right? So, but it's raining so hard. Now, this is a four-minute exposure. I needed four minutes to get around and light paint. Uh, there's four different light painting spots. Uh, the light here, and then uh, I came to the other side of the bridge. And there's uh, an embankment that goes down. And I walked down the embankment and did some light painting of the trees up here and then backlit the tunnels, and then walked down the road and light painted from the front a little bit. So it's pouring, and it's like, I'm going to do the shot. I'm already set up. I'm already wet. I'm going to get the shot. Uh, takes me a few times. I'm getting the light wrong here and the light wrong here, trying to get it all right in the same frame. And I start rushing through it. And remember I said I had to go down that embankment? Just slid. <laughs> I just fell, slid down, lost the flashlight in the dark. Um, it was a blast. <laughs> but I got it. Uh, so this is another photo. Again, this was raining. Uh, this was during the workshop. Um, we, it, was, it was raining a second night. And so we had the idea, let's have the group shoot from under the bridge. And we'll go out and do the light painting. We'll the ones who will get wet, right? Um, but we were having trouble light painting back here, getting everything lit well enough to make the photo interesting. And what we ended up doing is we, we had radios on us. And I went back to the car. So about, I want to say, maybe 75 yards this way is the area where we parked. And I turned on the headlights and shined them through the marsh. And by the time the light got over here, it was like perfect for the exposure. So this is all being lit by car headlights 75 yards that way. Who needs a flashlight when you have car headlights? Right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is Copplestone Bridge that I mentioned before. Um, this might be, in my opinion, the most photogenic one. Uh, like I said, they're all, all 17 bridges have a unique design. This is the only one built with cobblestones. It's really beautiful work. Uh, and it takes, you know, half hour or so on walking on a carriage road to get out to it. Beautiful walk. Um, and uh, you, can, you can work from both sides of the stream. There's a walking bridge, so you can get across without getting wet. You can work from both sides of the bridge. You can work from up top. There's so many different angles and opportunities to shoot here. Uh, this is another bridge up in the same area. Uh, this is at um, Bubble Pond, uh, the bridge over there. This is another one of the easier ones to get to because it's right near a parking area. And this is um, Hadlock Bridge. I always confuse Hemlock and Hadlock Bridge. I know, I know the two. You show me any photo of either of them, and I know it's one of those two. And I, I mix up the names in my head all the time. So this is Waterfall Bridge. Um, I've never learned why they named it that. Uh, but this is about, I'm going to say this takes about 30 to 40 minutes to walk to. And this is a great spot to shoot, too, because there's two bridges that are really close to each other, both very photogenic. The kind of place where you could spend the whole day there doing different compositions. When they designed this bridge, uh, they built it, the, the angle, specifically so that uh, if you're not if, not if you're walking in the carriage road, but if you're walking on the trail that goes to the waterfall, you come around the bend, and this is what you say. So you're coming up the trail, and the trail goes under the bridge, and the waterfall's right there, and really, really pretty spot. They did a nice job on this. So the other bridge I mentioned is um, Hadlock Bridge, right? And no, no, the other one's Hadlock. This is Hemlock. Mm -hmm. So this is Hemlock Bridge, uh, and this is just about maybe 100 yards down the carriage road. Um, in fact, there was one time I went to shoot Waterfall Bridge, and there was a workshop there. And I'm like, oh, great. People, right? Uh, so I went and shot this bridge instead until they moved here, and then I moved to Waterfall Bridge. Smart. So I too tried to shoot this bridge, but I came in the summer and there was no water. So um, I was not as fortunate as Chris. Even the Waterfall Bridge, there was really no water. I tried a long exposure and nothing was really working. So I said, well, you know, the bridge is still pretty, but it would be a lot prettier if there was waterfall 
But um, so what I did was I gave it a little um, twist and I said, all right, well, at least that made for a more interesting picture. It was just kind of a longer exposure and I just kind of jilted my camera and I was trying to make the best out of a nice bridge with a boring, uh, boring uh, rock formation uh, with a little twist. So uh, if you're not getting the image you're, not, you're hoping for, um, still try and be creative and look for other, other ways to, to do it. Um, so we talked about Jordan Pond already, but there's lakes and ponds all over the park. Um, uh, it's, you know, uh, mountain setting um, and forest settings, and uh, the lakes and the ponds are really beautiful to shoot. Uh, this is Eagle Lake, which is probably the easiest to get to, because mm -hmm. even if you're not there to visit the park, you're going to drive past Eagle Lake at some point. Uh, so this is it in the fall, and then in the winter, this is a shot I did of the Milky Way over Eagle Lake, and it's actually, if you go back uh, to Chris's picture, it's the same exact spot, but this tree has fallen down since Chris has been there, because you can see the little tree and the big tree um, in, the, in my Milky Way shot. Um, my theory is that the, the, the uh, tree was in her shot, so she knocked it down. <laughs> You're not supposed to tell everyone that, Chris. Um, but yeah, so I wouldn't have actually liked it, but it probably would have bl bl uh, blocked the Milky Way, so I'm actually kind of happy that it fell over. So um, to do a Milky Way shot, it was a, I think, a 20-second exposure. Um, I might have been shooting at 3200 ISO with a noise reduction setting on my camera. Um, I did a little bit of light painting to get the foreground, um, just to make it a little bit interesting. I tried it both ways, silhouetted, but I think to add a little bit more character to the picture, it's good to, to paint in a little bit so you can get more details of the environment you're shooting in. So the Milky Way is awesome. I, I hope to get some pictures of that moving forward, but uh, when you get a nice night, I mean, you could see the nebula and everything. It was spectacular. Eagle Lake's a good spot to shoot the Milky Way because uh, the Milky Way is going to be in the southern sky, and Eagle Lake uh, orients north to south, and the easiest way to access the lake is at the north end. So you could just get out of the parking lot, right. and it's going to be right over the bubbles at the end of the lake. Oh. So uh, This is a Beaver Dam Pond, uh, which I love driving by. That's uh, such a p pretty spot, and I've stopped there way more often than I've gotten good photos there. Uh, <laughs> but this is one where, in the fall one year, uh, the, the, the color was, was really good and um, just kind of isolated it with the reflection. You can see, I don't know what the dam is, but you can see in this photo there's two uh, beaver dens, and there's a few more in the pond, too. Um, so if you want to photograph beaver as well, bring a long lens and just sit at the side of the pond and <laughs> you'll see them before long. This is up at Bubble Pond. Um, again, you know, a lot of people when they shoot fall foliage, they're always aiming for peak foliage. I actually like shooting a little after peak uh, when some of the trees are bare already and then trying to create compositions by juxtaposing the trees that still have their leaves and have some color against the trees uh, that are just kind of gray because they've, they've lost their foliage already. And then the fog, too. We should talk about the fog. So the fog in Acadia can be really great. You start to get into midsummer and then into the fall. They get so much fog in August that the locals uh, call it fogist. Yeah. <laughs> Say it with a main accent. You're gonna... <laughs> fogist. This is over, uh, this is on the east side of the island, I'm sorry, the west side of the island at uh, Long Pond, which is really pretty, but I don't usually shoot at Long Pond because only it, it's another uh, body of water that runs north to south. And the east side of it is park property, but the west side of it is private property. So there's houses along, along the shore. Uh, not densely populated, but they're there. And again, I, I'm trying to shoot nature, so I don't want them in the photo. Uh, but here in the fog, one of the reasons I love shooting in the fog, I mean, of course, it's moody, right? But you can also use it to obscure or reveal the things that you want. You can use it, it's very good for controlling the background. There are houses here. I wouldn't have done this composition without the fog because I wouldn't want the houses in it. But the fog was just thick enough to hide them. So this looks like a photo that was shot in a completely natural setting um, when there's actually residences in the background. And then along the edge of the pond, uh, too, this is, right, this is right at Long Pond as well, uh, right off to the side. 
Where's this again? So this is um, it's Susan's photo, but I know where it is. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, at uh, Otter, 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 Cove, Otter Cove, which is along the coast. Uh, you drive along, and the road goes right over a dam, and the cove is to your left, and then on the right, there's this this pond that comes under the, the right. bridge into the So it, there's into the this cove. is one of those moments where you're driving along, and you see something, and you're like, what? And you pull over, and uh, thankfully, they have a nice little place where you can park um, on the side, little gap, because a lot of people just pull over and park everywhere in the park. So thankfully, that's permitted. And I pulled over and I tried a bunch of different takes with this picture. There was some flowering bushes, there was some long grass, and eventually I settled on this picture with the rocks because it was the lowest angle for me to get the reflections of the water and the um, leading lines into the mountain in the back. Um, I also did a 30 second uh, exposure with my ND filter because I wanted to get the water to look like glass reflective surface. So you can see there's no ripples, it's really smooth, and you can also see the blur of the sky. Another thing that I did was really interesting with this picture was I added a three-stop um, gradated filter because the sky was getting slightly blown out, so you'll notice the top ridge is a little bit darker uh, because I wanted to burn that in a little bit. So it kind of took a couple different techniques, but I think I got it to right where I wanted it to be. Um, but always try and get low angles. I really think that's an interesting take on pictures and look for leading lines. Uh, so this is at the Tarn, which is a very shallow pond uh, in a spot that was carved out by uh, glacial activity. And the interesting thing about shooting at the Tarn is uh, at the edge of it, it well, like I said, it's shallow, so you very rarely get ripples. You can get nice reflections, but at the edge, the cliff just goes up. And in the morning, about, I'd say maybe an hour after sunset, the sunrise, the, uh, the sun is hitting the cliff, but not the pond. So you've got a, the reflection of the light on the pond that you juxtapose with things in the water, you know, the plant life that's still in shadow. And you can do some really interesting work there. This um, reminds me of a Monet picture. Of a Monet? Yeah. Sure. With the little lily pads and the abstract colors. Yeah. So this is at another long pond. Uh, there's two long ponds on the island. Uh, so because of that, they call this one Little Long Pond uh, because it's littler. They should have done it the other way, right? Like Little John and Robin Hood. Uh, Little Long Pond is technically not in park property. It's uh, part, the, the property is still owned by the Rockefeller family, but they, it may as well be part of the park. They let people visit it. It has the same atmosphere of the park. It's right at the edge of the park. Uh, there's some carriage roads that go through it, and um, it, it's very much a part of the experience of visiting Acadia. Um, I too came across some lily pads, but my flowers were in bloom. And um, one of the most interesting thing with shooting flowers is really working on composition. Like uh, you can shoot it any which way. I had as many flowers as, he, as there were lily pads. So I kind of cropped in and tried to tell the story of this triangular vision of the lily pads, but it really challenges you to work on your composition and shapes and leading lines and to make your eye wander around the picture. You know, keep it coming back instead of it just going right out of the picture. Try and create an interesting uh, subject to, to keep your, your eyes looking around. Uh, so this is a different take on the lily pads, obviously. Um, so I, I, was shoot, I was actually scouting more than shooting at this point because the light was still kind of harsh, but I, I saw the lily pads with the water reflecting off of them. And how I shot them was I, uh, I used a polarizing filter, first of all, to remove the reflection from the water. Uh, there was no way I was getting the reflection off the pads because the light was so bright. So it's being backlit. The sun is coming and bouncing off the lily pads and right into my face. Along with the polarizer, then what I did is I exposed for the highlights, completely for the highlights, and let the shadows just go completely black, which is how I created this effect. This is actually the trail going around Little Long Pond. I totally recommend you doing it. It's a short little walk around the lake. Um, and this is like a little bridge that they had uh, for you to cross over the marshy area. And I just love the leading lines, like a uh, typical like New England, hiking in New England shot. It just makes you want to grab your hiking boots and your camera and uh, run into the wilderness. So um, I also love the greenery all around it. it kind of is um, really inviting. So. Uh, 
just keep an eye out for leading lines that make you want to embark on an adventure. <laughs> okay, so Pretty Marsh. Two funny things about Pretty Marsh. Um, one, in this photo, it's not very pretty. <laughs> <laughs> I've also never seen a marsh there. Uh, so Pretty Marsh is this little section of the park over on the west, and uh, it's, it's tiny, um, but there's some interesting things to photograph there. So one is it does have some nice shoreline uh, that you can walk along. Also in the fall, you get these just really brightly colored mushrooms that grow. There's a, a pine grove and a picnic area as you first go in and these little mushrooms come up, um, shooting in the rain again. Um, and uh, so that's pretty to shoot. But the reason we wanted to mention Pretty Marsh is remember we said there's not a lot of spots in Acadia that are good for sunset? This is one of them because it's the only spot on the west coast of the island, right on the coast of the island uh, that faces west so you can do good sunsets from here. Cool. So the harbors, um, if you want to do, like we said, there's more to shoot on the island than just the park, and the harbors are really great photography subject. Uh, there's a bunch of them. These are the major ones. There's some smaller ones uh, that dot the island. Uh, but just to give you a sense, so this is at, um, uh, this is shot from one of the gardens on the mm -hmm. island. You remember which one? I don't remember the okay. name. Okay, so there's, a, there's some private slash public gardens on the island that are also good for shooting. Uh, but you know, you're driving around and, and you know, you just kind of come across these harbors and uh, some of them are still working fishing harbors. Uh, this is at Southwest Harbor, uh, which is my favorite spot to stay on, on the island. There's a couple of great breakfast places there. Uh, this is at uh, Bernard, which is right across the harbor from Bass Harbor. Uh, this is, I think this is Northwest Harbor, which is in the south central part of the island. Seriously. And then again, the fog. This is, a, this is right up Bar Harbor. So Bass Harbor, not the harbor itself, but just the region, is a good spot to shoot. Again, most people who come to the park are over here. This is the quiet side, but there's some really nice spots to shoot down in this area where you could spend enough time here that so it would be worth staying here rather than Bar Harbor, just so you're closer to the locations. So this is the Bass Harbor Head Lighthouse. Um, one of the challenges when you come here to shoot is there's a lot of photographers who know about it and um, they're gonna be there waiting for sunrise or sunset to shoot it as well. So I always challenge myself to try and do something that no one else is doing. So um, I kind of walked closest to the water, basically one rock away from actually standing in the water, um, to try and get the lowest angle to shoot up at the lighthouse and, um, and to get an interesting foreground and leading lines leading up to the lighthouse. Um, it's a 26-foot high tower, and uh, this is one of the most iconic locations of the park. So prepare yourself. Just in, in Maine in as Maine. well. This okay. is actually, this lighthouse is on the back of the Maine State Quarter. Okay. So um, so just be aware that some other photographers may know about it. Um, and uh, to get there early, to kind of claim your spot and do your own scouting. So when I'm not closest to the water, I try and find some... Uh, other interesting angles. Um, I saw this puddle that was kind of just laying there and doing nothing and kind of blocking my way. So I said, what about if I lay in this puddle and try and get a reflection of the lighthouse? Uh, I know this will be a completely original shot because no one has done it. And I did it and I thought it was pretty successful. And I uh, felt pretty accomplished as I slept, so, stepped away with my wet sweatshirt and my wet pants from laying in the puddle. And um, everyone kind of asked to see my picture and then everyone followed my lead. So um, at least I was the first person to take that picture that day. I might not have been the last one. Um, Another way to capture an original image is to ask a cute photography couple who are standing right next to me if they wanted to be a part of the image. Um, I love incorporating people, as I've said before, and they're very willing models and have since like posted all over their Facebook. But see if you could find someone, something to make the picture original. And uh, since it's such a well-shot lighthouse, think about what you could do to add your little spin on it. See, another way we're different. I would be like, just go away. <laughs> Uh, so this is a, 
uh, I shot this in the winter, and uh, I knew it was going to be snowing the next day. So I kind of set up the composition, then came back in the morning and just waited for the snow to, to lace the scene. Again, not shooting the obvious. If you're shooting Bass Head Lighthouse, this is like turning around. So I turned around, I liked the, uh, the shape of the coast with the island in the background and waited for some waves to come up and trying not to get wet in the process. Right. So again, always turn around, see what's behind you too. Sure. Uh, this is in the same area. This is uh, uh, right across, this is in Bernard, right across from Bass Harbor. And uh, this is the Centennial Lighthouse. It's actually privately owned. Um, uh, there's a little sign out that says, photographers, if nobody's staying here, feel free. But if you're going to sell the image, you got to tell me. Uh, I didn't see the sign. I, I did see the, uh, uh, it was like the, the for rent. They rent this. And I called, and I asked for permission to shoot. And he said, oh, yeah, I have a blast. And he couldn't believe I actually called. He's like, everybody just shoots. Thanks for calling. Uh, but he told me to stay as long as I wanted. So I stayed long enough to, to get a bunch of different angles. And... Uh, also in the same area is the, the uh, Bass Harbor Marsh, which you don't have a lot of access to to shoot, but it's a really stunning spot. You have to be careful, because the best spots to shoot are right along the road. Uh, this is an easy spot to miss because the road kind of comes down and goes across a narrow bridge and it's the kind of space to drive where you're a little nervous about other cars so you're really focusing on the road. But if you do take the time to look to the right, yeah, you see this spot. The reason I mention all this is because if you do want to shoot here, be careful. There was a, there's not a lot of room to work and a few years ago a photographer was hit by a car and killed uh, shooting at the side of the road here. Um, but if you're brave enough, these are the kinds of things you can do. No guts, no glory. There you go. <laughs> uh, so this is down at Seawall, again in the Bass Harbor area. Um, Seawall is a, a, a spot where you, it's uh, it's not a long hike, but you got to you know hike a little bit to get there, maybe 20 minutes or so. And um, it's another kind of area where you might find that you have it to yourself for the morning. And it's beautiful for sunrise. And I, I spent, I mean, the couple of times I've been there, I just spent hours, um, so right from sunrise, shooting in the sunrise light. Uh, on one occasion, I, the tide was going out, so the seagulls were feeding, and I ended up the last hour, I just sat in one spot with 300 millimeter lens, just photographing seagulls. It can become addicting. You're kind of just watching these creatures swoop in and out, and yeah. just trying to get a good shot is a challenge, you know, like because there's so much movement. And yeah. these, I remember these two were arguing about Canada Nikon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Obviously, the Canon one was right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, people think of tide pools as a West Coast phenomenon. Acadia has some really nice tide pools. Uh, tripod, macro lens. Uh, so one morning I was there to shoot the sunrise and then the, the waves started catching my eyes because they were being backlit by the sunrise. The sun's coming right across the water and backlighting the waves as they're crashing. So I ended up spending about an hour and a half shooting these instead. Uh, a little ways down from seawall is another area on the shore called um, uh, why am I blanking on it? Do you remember? Okay, so it's another area. It's really nice. <laughs> <laughs> It'll come to me. Um, uh, again, and it's it's similar to Seawall, but the scenery is kind of different because the coast is different. Uh, Seawall is um, uh, this this looks more like the coast on the other side of the island. We've got the kind of the big rocks, and you can get the tide pools and. Okay, so Bar Harbor. So Bar Harbor is where you go when you're tired of hiking and eating trail mix. Bar Harbor is like where all the tourists go to eat some good food and um, we'll just go eat some good food and uh, get your lobster fix and uh, eat some good seafood and do a little shopping. Uh, it's a great little harbor town. Um, there's yachts pulling in. There's beautiful boats. Um, really lively. It's a quintessential New England town with all the kind of um, 
beauty that you'd expect. It's a coastal town. You can take your picture with one of these lobster faces. I mean, why not? Um, and eat some good uh, lobster chowder at Stu Min's. Um, they even have a whole wall of license plates, which I thought was pretty cute to photograph. There's definitely kitschy parts of, yes, definitely. of Bar Harbor. Um, but it doesn't get cheesy. Like, the Jersey Shore is really quaint, and uh, it's really, really cute. Like, you'll get there, and you probably won't want to leave. You'll be like, why don't we just, like, uh, take the evening and, and drink some wine? Because they have locally produced uh, wines and vineyards and all this great lo local organic food that you just want to stay there for the whole weekend. But definitely do uh, spend the day hiking and, and, and appreciate those the, the evening life in uh, Bar Harbor. They even have seagulls. He was an Olympus shooter. <laughs> yeah, so. so another thing from Bar Harbor is uh, I mentioned before that there's a couple islands you can walk out to at low tide. Right off of Bar Harbor is Bar Island, uh, which is part of Acadia. And at low tide, you can walk out to it um, and walk around the shore. There's some trails that go through the island. Uh, so this is, you shot for this from the bar, right? Sure. So this is actually the walkway where you walk to Bar Harbor Island. I don't know if it's coming back from low tide um, or just filling in, but this is the walkway you'd walk. You can see there's still some people out there, a lot of kayaking and paddleboarding go from this area. Um, it's really pretty. It's also an okay place for sunset. Not the best, but you still get a good view. All right. Nice to shoot at dusk too. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, they do get the cruise ships coming in. So shooting out here at dusk and uh, uh, I was just impressed with the the size. I mean, I've been on cruise ships. You know, you see them on the on the west side all the time, but seeing them next to the boats. And, right. Uh, so also on Bar Harbor, uh, I will admit I got the this uh, the idea for this photo from a student on a workshop because um, she had shot it. I was like, oh, what a great idea! And I was out shooting and it's raining and everything, and I didn't want to go back to the hotel yet, but I was back in Bar Harbor, and so I kind of did my own take on it. Uh, but this is this little pier. Um, near the near the harbor that, that goes out. Uh, you can just make out a boat right over here. And then the last photo I did before I headed in was, was this. Wait, was it this, raining again? It was still raining. <laughs> I was soaked. Um, I was wet and cold and miserable, but still shooting. Uh, so this is a little different for me. I don't usually shoot man-made stuff, uh, kind of an abstract, but I, I liked the image. And that's how I ended that night. Okay, so the Skudik Peninsula. You see the stars way over there, because that's where it is. Uh, <laughs> Skudik Peninsula is not on the main island, um, but it's a really stunning part of the park that I highly recommend you take the time to go visit. You gotta drive back onto the mainland, and it's about 45 minutes to the east, and then you gotta drive down onto the Skudik Peninsula to get down to Skudik Point. It is definitely not hard to get to, but because it's away from the famous part of the park, only about 10% of the people who visit Acadia ever go out to Skudik. So if, uh, you know, if you're there on a holiday weekend and you go on you know, Fourth of July weekend or something and the crowd's in the park, if it's crowded someday, you want someplace quiet, go out to Skudik. Uh, just to give you a sense of what you're gonna find out there. You got some coastline. Um, Skudik, you're on the tip of the peninsula, so there is some west coast to it, which means this is the third spot in the park where you're gonna get good sunset opportunities. There's also uh, Little Moose Island. This is one of the other islands that you can walk out to at low tides. So you can see the tide had just gone out. And um, this was a good use of the tide app that I mentioned before, is I wanted to go out on the Little Moose Island in the morning and I checked the tide app at the beginning of the week to see which morning I could get out there during good light. So i uh, walk out to the island and then this is, this is what the trails look like on Little Moose Island. They're pretty narrow uh, because it's just not an often visited spot. This is looking back toward the mainland. <laughs> um, and then also just kind of wandering around and finding some detail work to do. Uh, one time out there, I, this was just kind of quirky. I don't know what seagull left this behind, but it had been there long enough to bleach in the sun. <laughs> and then uh, the fog too, just like in the main part of the park, you can get some really trippy light with the fog out here. 
I loved this with the fog being, it was just like this band of fog and you could see the land and the water underneath it, but nothing in the middle. What you needed was a bird flying right through the middle. Yeah. <laughs> and then like, oh. uh, So right down at Skudik Point is probably the best, well, one of the best spots in the park to shoot waves uh, because the, they're, um, you know, I get these big boulders and if, uh, if there's a storm while I'm at Acadia, the next day I go to Skudik Point because all the waves coming in and try to time it for like an hour or two before a high tide while all the energy is rushing in and the water hits these boulders and just huge spray. Uh, the one thing you have to be careful about is you don't want to get right to the edge. Every couple of years somebody makes the news for being washed out. If, uh, if a wave knocks you into the water, it's almost impossible to get back out again. Another thing to bring when you're doing coastal pictures is a lens cloth. There's always yeah. spray hitting your lens, and how many times are you using your shirt or something to wipe off the spray? Bring a lens cloth. It's almost as important as not standing close to the lens, the end, so you don't get <laughs> smashed into the water. Equally important things to remember when you go there. And then right in the same area, but completely different take on the waves, doing a long exposure. Again, this is with the this is with my ten stop neutral density. Um, I use B&W filters and also uh, format high-tech. I love the format high-tech filters. And then another great spot to shoot at night. Um, down at Scooter Point, uh, this was last year, and just got this great Milky Way. Uh, it's, there's even less light at Scooter Point than in the main part of the park. Okay, so that's Acadia. Um, like we've mentioned a few times, we're running a workshop there this coming October, which we're really excited about. It's the first right. time Susan and I are working together. Uh, if you have any questions about it, feel free to ask either you know, now or afterward, or email us all the information's at photoradventures.com. Um, and then finally, just thanks again to Chimani for uh, making this all possible and for B&H for having us. Thank so, you, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh,